All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. It gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you all to this, our uh, first a mass AITC webinar. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the executive committee, uh, Jason Maloney, Deepak Ganesan, uh, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Natish Chowdhury. For those of you who I have not met, I'm one of the co-PIs of the center. I'm a professor at Harvard uh, and uh, based at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And this webinar series, we will now have a, a series of them. You'll be hearing a lot about them over time. We um, are, are welcoming members of our community to share with us either something about a technological problem or solution um, or a clinically oriented problem that are looking for technological solutions, sort of a hammers and a nails kind of perspective. Um, and we are thrilled uh, that Dr. Rebecca Spencer is with us today. So Becky is a member of our executive committee and helped us uh, put together the center to begin with. Uh, she's a professor uh, and neuroscientist in, uh, at UMass Amherst, uh, and she runs a very uh, well-funded, publicly funded sleep lab uh, as part of the uh, Institute for Applied Life Sciences at UMass Amherst. And so what we have asked Becky to talk to us about today is really about sleep measurement, um, because obviously in the context of cognitive impairment uh, and uh, the diagnosis of, uh, of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's and related dementias and or the consequences of the disease, sleep becomes a uh, remarkably important, both diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, and so uh, she's going to talk a little more generally about the, this and the technology, hopefully take about 35, 40 minutes to do that. Um, and then hopefully we can take 15 or 20 minutes to have a conversation, uh, clarify questions, think forward looking about what things like this may be useful for. We'd welcome you all to be active participants to the extent that you are comfortable. Um, I'll watch the chat. I suspect uh, Becky, like all the rest of us, uh, have been teaching in this format for now longer than we would like, is comfortable watching that, but I, I'll inter interject if necessary. But would then invite you to raise hands, shout out, I can read the questions, whatever makes you all comfortable. Um, and we look forward to a lively discussion. So Becky, thank you for launching our seminar series and the floor is yours. Well, thank you. And we'll just um, switch screens here. Um, so let's see if this works. Nope, just got my screen. Let's see if we can. We tested this and now it's gone. Um, not sure what is happening that's different. So I'll do it this way. Now are you seeing in my slides okay? Great. Okay, so um, let's hide this. Um, I assume that there's a pretty broad audience and so I'm giving you a broad introduction, but I'm talking about stuff that I love and find interesting and would talk about even in my spare time. So hopefully this gives you some threads that if you're interested in at all, um, please follow up with me. If you know we run out of time right afterwards, follow up with me at any, any point in time. So um, just, you know, people are coming from so many different directions. And so some people I'm assuming I need to still like get interested in the bandwagon of sleep and um, sleep is an amazing thing. We all do it. And it's great to talk about because everybody comes to my talks with some sort of sleep experience. And so we all have some common language that we're talking. Uh, and at the on the other hand, like sleep is relevant to so many different dimensions of our life and our health. It's relevant for our physical and mental and cognitive health. So sleep is associated with memory and decision-making and other cognitive functions that I could talk about, emotion regulation, which relates to mental health. Um, it's related to stress management, but more and more we're seeing the relationship between sleep and immune function, areas of physical health, um, and with relation to our interest in neurogenic degenerative diseases, it's also related to this process of brain waste clearing um, that I'll talk about more. But all of these things, right, that sleep plays into overall impact our quality of life. And on the other side of the equation, there's a lot of different kind of states of being that affect how we're sleeping. So obviously aging changes how we sleep, development changes how we sleep, 
the act of being a parent uh, changes how we sleep. So all of these different things can play into how a person is sleeping and then what your sleep outcomes are going to be. Um, and so this relates to interest in measuring sleep as part of many different studies and interest in improving sleep. Because if we can improve sleep in any of these different groups, we could theoretically improve sleep-related outcomes and um, quality of life. But I want to step back a bit and just give some insight to the broad audience in terms of how sleep works. Because I think if you're thinking about measuring sleep or why you might need to measure sleep, it's important to think a little further back of what is sleep doing that's so important in order to know which parts of sleep you might want to measure. So what I'm going to plot is your journey across the night. So when you go to sleep, you start out in wake and then you dip down into stage one of sleep. This is really a transitional sleep stage that I would say doesn't have any um, clear purpose other than to help you transition into sleep. If you keep on sleeping, you'll find yourself in slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep is to me where a lot of the rich action happens. It's um, where memories are consolidated. There's some emotion processing that's taking place during slow wave sleep. And I'll introduce the glymphatic function, and that seems to be associated with slow wave sleep as well. Now, if you continue on through the night, you're going to bounce back and forth between other sleep stages. Primarily REM sleep is one that most people have heard of. We often think of REM as being about dreaming, which is a whole other talk that we could have, but um, it does seem that REM um, and some of these aspects of REM might be important for creativity and um, decision making. And there's also links between REM sleep and emotion regulation. Uh, carrying on throughout the night, you'll also see that you bounce into what's called stage two of non-REM sleep. There's a lot of relations between stage two and plasticity, and it's particularly related to motor learning. And so if your objective is to learn something that's very motoric, like um, tennis or playing the piano, uh, you can imagine that stage two is the sleep stage that might be of interest. And if you look across this night, you can see that a person is generally getting a lot of that slow wave sleep early in the night, a lot of the REM later in the night, and that you're bouncing back and forth generally between non-REM and REM sleep stages throughout the night. Um, so this can tell you a little bit about like, if you're interested in sleep, what is it you're interested in? And that can guide you then is in terms of thinking what you actually want to measure. To break this down a little further, I'm going to pull out two examples of, of what slow wave sleep does. So you can think a bit about how do we know that slow wave sleep has these functions. So um, let's start with memory consolidation. So a very simple example of how we look at sleep, of how sleep's role in memory consolidation comes about is you can have an individual learn word pairs. So give a person a bunch of unrelated word pairs and then test their recall of those word pairs. And just get, that's just your baseline, how much did they encode? And then you can look at their performance after an interval that contains sleep. So look, if you test them at 8 p.m., see how much they remember at 8 a.m. Or you could look over an interval spent awake. So if I teach them at 8 a.m., I'll now look at 8 p.m. So you can compare these two intervals. And what you can see is at baseline, if I'm just training them up, teach somebody these tasks, whether I teach them in the morning or the evening, I get them to about the same level of encoding, so about 73%, right? So there's no difference at, at, in encoding at these two time points. But now look how performance changes 12 hours later. If I stayed awake for 12 hours, I've forgotten a lot of what you taught me. That's maybe a very familiar experience. If we um, you know, go to a talk and it's at 8 a.m. and you meet the three people sitting around you and you learn their names, by 8 p.m. you've probably forgotten those names. You've learned other things, you've had all, the, all these other different experiences, you've studied something. So we kind of forget those things we learned in the morning. That's a common experience. But if you slept during that 12 hours, same amount of time, you see that you actually protect the memory. So whatever number of names or word pairs that I learned, I'm going to remember just as many 
the following morning. And there's a couple of different explanations for this uh, fact that I am showing here. On the one hand, it could just be simply a time of day effect and that in this condition when I slept, maybe I'm just better at recalling these things in the morning. But we've done a number of different controls and that doesn't seem to be the case. And this is particularly true if you think about this being young adults, there's no way that our young adults are doing better in the morning than in the evening. If anything, it tends to be the other way around. So that's not a likely explanation. Another uh, explanation is, like I said, like when you learn something in the morning, you go about your day and you have all this interfering information. And so it's maybe not that sleep was good, but just wake is bad. To look at that, we can also do this as a nap study where somebody comes into the lab in the middle of the day and they either stay awake in the lab in the middle of the day or they take a nap. And what we find is that the results are very, very similar. And in that condition, when they're in the lab, we can control what kind of interference they have. So we're not allowing them to study things. We're not allowing them to watch some movie that will conflict with these memories. And so we really have control over that interfering information. And yet we see the same difference occurring. So instead, we interpret this as evidence of um, sleep-dependent memory consolidation, that, that memories are enhanced over an interval of sleep. And I'm going to say a bit more about that. So most commonly, you think of memory as having two stages. Right now, you're learning something, so you're encoding a memory. And later, somebody might ask you over dinner, tell me about that talk you went to this afternoon. That would be the memory stage of recall. But in between, whether you're awake or asleep, there's an interval of consolidation of the memories being kind of packed away. And that term just simply refers to memories becoming more stronger and more efficient offline, not while you're engaged in the task at all. And when you hear this term sleep dependent memory consolidation, it just refers to the fact that this process of consolidation is greater over intervals of sleep. And that's because there's an active process going on in the brain during sleep. Here's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. And even if you aren't interested in animal science and animal studies, I think this is a fun and interesting example that really captures it for all of us. So if you take a little critter and you put electrodes into its hippo hippocampus, the memory area of the brain, and you record some baseline activity. So each of these color lines is just reflecting the firing of a neuron. So that's just random. And then <clears throat> during uh, the day, I can keep recording the hippocampus of this critter as the critter runs a maze. So now they have a, a maze that they can redo and there's certain locations on the maze. And now I get a pattern of firing in the hippocampus. And let's say that pattern looks like this. Obviously, these were aligned and color coded for with intention. But the idea is that this neuron fires and then this one and this one and so forth. So you get this kind of sequence of firing of different neurons depending upon where the animal is in the maze. OK, that's fine. That's something that's already been known about how the hippocampus encodes location. But what is important here is that now if I keep recording during sleep, so now this animal's back asleep, I'm still recording in its hippocampus, now you don't see some random pattern of firing. Instead, you see that exact same pattern of firing that you saw while the animal was doing the maze. Do you see how like this one fires and this one? You see that same order of neuron firing that was associated with the maze. Okay, so what does that mean? That is, under, that is the data that underlies this idea that while we sleep, we take the essentially the video of our day and we replay it, and we replay it over and over again. That's the idea that memories are replayed during sleep. And that's a very cool and interesting mnemonic device, right? So if I, when I was a teenager and I wanted to learn all the words to my favorite song, I would put it in a uh, tape recorder and put it on, on replay and listen to it over and over again. And that's a mnemonic device, right? We listen to things on repeat in order to learn them. And that's really the, the um, strategy that the brain is taking is putting something on replay in order to learn it really well. But something else that's really cool is that you can also then learn and fast forward. So something that took 500 milliseconds to happen while I was awake only takes 50 milliseconds while I was asleep. So that's like a super fast, high speed, efficient memory process. 
And this is just saying that this pattern of firing obviously looks more like this pattern of firing than the other way around. So that's the actual statistics. So the reason that I bring this up is it tells us not just what is sleep's function, but which part of sleep is doing the important business, right? So if I'm interested in sleep being important for memory, this process that I showed you is not just happening throughout the night, it's happening specifically during slow wave sleep. Slow wave sleep is also known as non-REM stage three. So when you want, if this is a process that's of interest and, you know, an activity of sleep that's really important to you, slow wave sleep is where that business is happening. You also see that in those human studies, like I explained with the word pair learning, that performance on that is specifically associated with slow wave sleep. And then people that are brave enough to get individuals to sleep in an MRI, what they see is that there's activity in the hippocampus in during slow wave sleep. And that's important as well, right? So it's hard to get somebody to sleep in the MRI, but when you do, you can see that while they're in slow wave sleep in particular, there's activity in the hippocampus. So the memory area of our brain is really busy while we're sleeping. And this is just showing um, anybody interested in kind of the real nuts and bolts of it. When you have memory replay happening in the hippocampus, you get certain bursts of activity and that is aligned with things we can measure in the sleep EEG. So this is trying to translate between that stuff that happens deep down in the brain and the hippocampus, we can't measure in a human EEG, but we can measure things that coincide with those. Um, so they're called hippocampal ripples. They coincide with these sleep spindles. They coincide with these big slow oscillations, things that you can actually measure out in the cortex. So just to put this one other way, when memories come into our brain in the short term, we put them in the hippocampus. And if you stay awake, they're just going to sit there in the hippocampus and they can get interfered with versus when I use that term consolidation or refer to sleep's role in memory, what happens is they can be kind of translated or copied out of the hippocampus and get stabilized out into the cortex. So that was just emphasizing, giving some background as to how sleep does this function. And I want to, for the interest of this audience, just say a little bit about the glymphatic function. So um, in the, the glymphatic system is a waste clearing system of the brain. Um, and the idea is that cerebral spinal fluid pulses across um, the brain, particularly again, during slow wave sleep. And that has the ability to wash out some of this neurotoxic waste, including things like um, amyloid beta and tau proteins. This is just a video, if I have it working, showing how you can see pulses of that kind of cleaning that's happening while we're sleeping, and that this is related then to that process of um, cleaning out neurotoxic waste. Uh, my main point here is to say that these two functions are both specifically related to slow wave sleep. And so if these are, you know, if you're interested in a population and um, whether I can say improve their sleep, think about what part of sleep you're trying to improve and are you getting improvement in the part of the sleep that you're interested in? And that will be relevant as I now move into talking about various different devices and how we can measure sleep. So this is just reiterating what I said, that sleep is, it's not homogenous, it changes throughout the night, and the function changes coincident with these different stages of sleep, and that it's slow wave sleep in particular is important for the lymphatic function and the cognitive functions, but it might not be important if, you know, say motor learning is what's important to you. So now let's just give some overview of sleep measurement before I dive down into some of the deeper nuts and bolts of sleep measurement. So broadly speaking, we use polysomnography in order to measure sleep. I'm showing two examples here. Um, in sleep research, you're more likely to see it done with the electrodes in a cap versus in a clinical setting, you might see a lot of just individual electrodes um, glued to the head. And in both cases, the point is though that you have a certain set of electrodes that can measure brain activity, uh, eye movements, and muscle activity. That's kind of the core of polysomnography. There's many more different measures you could have in your montage, particularly for clinical purposes. But for the real basics of you know sleep versus wake and sleep measurement, that's the minimal montage that 
you typically need. So why is that montage important? And it's because those three characteristics are important in order to both identify sleep, which is all of these down here in blue versus wake up here in yellow. And having more of that montage can also help you distinguish within areas of sleep, what's what. So for instance, if I'm interested in just simply detecting sleep onset, sleep versus wake, I could, could just look at the EEG activity. And if I did that, it would be pretty tricky because I could easily distinguish wake from slow wave sleep, but wake versus REM is quite a hard thing to tell apart. The brain waves look quite similar. And so that's why you need some other information, which you could go for the chin EMG, which is telling you whether there's muscle activity because REM is characterized by muscle atonia and or, and often you need both, um, eye activity in order to look for those classic rolling eye movement, rapid eye movements that characterize REM sleep. So you can see really characteristic eye movements that give REM its name um, versus the kind of more just uh, darting movements that characterize somebody that's awake but has their eyes closed. So if that's how you, you would need that mont those three things then to tell sleep from wake, particularly if you have REM in that sleep episode, then within sleep, you need some of this information to characterize REM from non-REM. Although at this point, once you have sleep, you can distinguish a lot within the EEG. So you can see how slow wave sleep is characterized by those big slow waves that are beautiful in the EEG. Stage two is often characterized by these spindles that are really um, distinct, as well as these big bursts of K-complexes. So this is just to say that if you really want to know different sleep stages, these are the things that underlie the differences of sleep stages. There's differences in brain activity, but there's also differences in other physiological measures that we sometimes rely on to tell these stages apart. So Obviously, the pro of you know using polysomnography is that it's the gold standard. I mean, this is this is what we base things on and compare things to, and it provides good access to sleep stages. Um, but uh, it's a tough technique to do. We've been doing it for years in my lab. We have all different setups, and yet you know even at our best, it's you know a half hour of setup. It's a lot of time to go through and and stage the data by hand. Um, so it requires an individual to go to a person's home or have them come to the lab. Uh, it, it's a quite a clunky um, uh, technique. And it's uncomfortable for the person um, as seen in this cartoon. Okay, Mrs. Tully, we want you to relax and get a good night's sleep and we'll evaluate if you have any sleep issues when meanwhile, your person is like wrapped up in cords and it feels like somebody's staring at you and you know sometimes there's cameras on you. So obviously that's a hard sleep environment if we're putting something uncomfortable on them. It's expensive and it's time consuming. Uh, and that's why actigraphy has been a popular choice for assessing sleep. Um, so for those that don't know, actigraphy is commonly used in a watch. Often we're familiar with um, some of the commercial versions of it, like a Fitbit. And what it's doing is providing an estimate of sleep by identifying intervals that have little to no activity. Here's an example. So one pro of actigraphy is it's more inexpensive. It's more comfortable. It's just typically like wearing a wristwatch. So you can get a lot of days of data. And so here's an example of days of data. Each line is a different day. You can see here midnight in the middle. You can see the black as the bursts of activity. Actually, I think I zoom in on this. The black is um, areas of activity during the day. And you can see there's none of that really in this blue period where it's been marked as sleep. There's a little burst of activity that's actually pretty small relative to what we might see. This is a kiddo. I, I believe this is a child because that's pretty solid sleep um, from even compared to some healthy adults. What we see in this one, just for your information, the yellow line is showing you light information that was picked up by this particular watch. Um, but in general, you see, okay, there's activity that happens, and so they're, con they're considered awake. There's no activity that's happening, so I'm guessing that they're asleep. Likewise, during the day, you might have a period uh, where 
Okay, there's no activity, so I'm gonna guess that they're asleep. These bars below it is just showing you a hypnogram, so that sleep staging information. So you can get a feel for that, how there's a lot of richness of this data you might get with polysomnography that you can't pick up in actigraphy. Actigraphy might show, so these red bars underneath are showing us, okay, there was a little low level activity there, but it doesn't always consistently align with a particular sleep stage. So this just shows you how it can be, a, uh, the actigraphy can be decent at kind of guessing when sleep onset happened and when wake onset happened, but kind of the richness that, of the data that you get from polysomnography is, is a bit trickier. So that br brings me to what I'm calling sleep measurement 2000, 2022, um, where we've obviously kind of expanded beyond just basic actigraphy. This watch right here is the research-based actigraph watch that we've used in a lot of our work. But if you look at the commercial space, you can see how actigraphy has evolved. And it's also evolved into not just being wrist-based. And um, some of these devices, I have another slide that shows you, don't always contain that um, actigraph, although most of them do. But the idea is now we're thinking of whether we can make improve on that basic algorithm that uh, actigraphy uses. Can we, and if actigraphy is good at guessing when sleep and wake is, is happening, can we make it better um, with some of the other measures that these devices add on? Can we make it more comfortable maybe by uh, adding, taking that sleep measurement from a different location? So here's even a nearable instead of a wearable. And so this is how the sleep space has evolved as thinking about, can we make it more comfortable? Can we include different measures? And you'll see on the market, a lot of different products that are adding different measures to try to enhance that sleep algorithm. Here's a nice, um, this is a figure from a nice review paper that I cite down at the bottom and I'm happy to share my slides and this is being recorded for anybody that's interested. Um, but what the point of this is, is that, you know, we've expanded this to have provide a lot of different measures of sleep. And that is because we now know that um, when sleep stages change or when you go from wake to sleep, there's other physiological responses that correspond to that that we can use to then inform our sleep-wake estimate. For instance, you can see changes in temperature, you can see changes in respiration, things like that that happen coincident with a sleep onset but also happen with sleep stage changes. And so more and more devices are relying on this in order to improve their algorithms improve their ability to detect sleep stages and so forth. Um, some of them include light information, some of them include noise sensors and so forth. And so the idea is now that we have various different other correlates of these sleep stages and sleep wake, we can add those into algorithms. So this is just, we pulled this together and I think the interns in the sleep lab uh, for their help with this, that we've pulled this slide together to give you an idea of how the different measures are um, contributing to the estimates and the data provided by different devices. Now I will say we don't actually know what they're using in their algorithm. So for instance, we can find that um, snoring is measured by, you know, the sleep profiler. We, in a lot of these cases, we don't know their actual sleep-wake detection algorithm to know how much that's weighing into the output. Um, that is one of the things that we'll get back to as a, a challenge of these devices. But in general, you can see across the devices, almost all are really working with some sort of actigraphy as its base and adding in some of these other measures for various reasons. And unfortunately, in spite of like all that we're adding and twisting and turning and you know jumping up and down about for these devices, pretty consistently there's some challenges to how accurate these um, measures are. So um, these are just a few headlines from over time questioning uh, the, the value of these devices and whether they're actually worth it. Um, and I, I'm gonna break that down a bit in terms of whether they are. So on the one hand, you could say, oh, the devices are great because if I look at something like total sleep time as a measure, 
these devices, across devices, you see they're doing reasonably well, um, particularly over here, you've got reasonably good um, estimates of total sleep time. The problems, though, that I want to point out are number one is that some of them are doing pretty bad, right? Um, you have some uh, devices that have a reasonably high error rate, such as um, the, the sleep watch, the Garmin. Um, and I, the Garmin, I actually meant to go back and look which Garmin this was because it can vary even across Garmin devices. Likewise, it can vary across Fitbit devices. So never take the values of the validity and reliability of one device and guess that it's going to do the same because like the Fitbits vary dr dramatically and same with the Garmin. But you can see that there's really high error for some of the devices. And even those devices that do well, the concern is that there's huge intersubject variability. And so if I want to use this device in my study, for instance, like what if this is my participant or this is my participant or this is my participant? What am I, what am I misunderstanding or misassuming if we're this far off? And I'd say one of the challenges for the field is to understand who are these people? Do we know what makes a person not fitting of um, kind of these means and the uh, assumptions that it takes to be down here? I'll also point out while I'm here because I don't have it in the slides, devices tend to do well with the measures of total sleep time and sleep efficiency. Sleep efficiency is being that value of how much time were you asleep during the sleep opportunity? So it's usually a number that's like zero to 100 being like 100% of the time you, were, uh, you could sleep, you were asleep. Um, with most populations, though, I always put a warning on that. So if you have a device and it gives you a sleep score, you always feel like you want to get that number up to 100, but your goal should never be 100. If you sleep every second of your sleep opportunity, you're probably sleep deprived. So I always try to warn people, your goal is not 100. And so some of these devices for commercial use are also challenged by the fact that like there isn't help in interpreting that data. You're given that device and you come with your, your well, all through school, I wanted 100% on things. And so you get this like assumption that 100 is good and there's not a lot to tell a person that, no, no, you're, where should your goal be? And what to do with that data is something that um, has been lacking on, the, on this device space. So um, Another thing to think about is on this device space that a lot of them, unfortunately, particularly the newer devices, they're often biased by company involvement. I just say that as an aside to encourage you to look at um, who has funded the studies when you're looking at the device space, um, particularly with these new devices. It's again, it's primarily they're, they're self-funded. So the companies are paying for the studies to be done. Um, we're also often comparing apples and oranges. And this is something that I know even the FDA has tried to be involved in, but I was involved in some of their work over eight years and I, ago and I have not seen any changes since. So what I mean by that is if I take the measure of, um, let's take slow, total sleep time. And in my study, I'm collecting total sleep time using the Fitbit Versa. Two years later, I go to do a follow-up study, the Fitbit Versa is off the market, and I don't know what the Fitbit Versa used to estimate total sleep time. So now I'm comparing apples and oranges. I couldn't, I, there's, um, whether there's no pressure on these companies to have total sleep time, sleep efficiency be measured consistently across um, you know, different devices. So what you find in a measure from a paper that uses one device does not necessarily mean it's comparable to that same term, but using a different device. And um, devices change frequently. So I kind of mentioned that already, but it is amazing how quickly when we've done some of these validation studies, by the time the study is done, that device is no longer on the market. Even if it's going from a two to a three, they are changing their algorithms dramatically and sometimes even their hardware dramatically. And um, so it's hard to keep up with. It's hard to go back and, and redo something. It's hard to get access to um, something that was maybe even used just a year ago. And then as I've implied, like there's a lot of assumptions that we, uh, in these sleep measures, if you apply it to a study and something I'm gonna say more about, 
you don't know exactly you're getting output without knowing how they're getting it. They're keeping their algorithms to themselves, understandably, but it makes it a challenge when you're applying it to a population, as I'll illustrate. And then finally, it's super important that you have to have these devices validated in every different population you're working with. So knowing whether the assumptions of the device and the algorithm that made it valid in one population does not mean that, that assum those assumptions and devices will work equally in a different population. And that's really important to think about if you're thinking about working with aging and Alzheimer's disease, as I'll, as I'll illustrate. So for instance, if we take these two, um, you know, many of the studies are, of devices are validated over here in the strapping young adult. Um, but if you're thinking about, about applying it to an older age population, these groups have differences in sedentary time. And a lot of algorithms have some threshold that you need to cross over. And where that is can be very different if you're working with a sedentary person. BMI can affect how mobile somebody is during their sleep. And so if, again, if you have a threshold that's based on mobility during the night, um, BMI can affect that. Obviously the activity levels are gonna vary and it was not intentional that I chose this um, picture of the woman and she's knitting, but that's an activity that can really fool an actograph watch, right? So if I'm knitting away suddenly, and there's people in this field that have had this happen, um, suddenly you have an older woman that might look like she's running a marathon because her hand is busy knitting away. Um, so the types of activity that an individual do, does on, on average can also be important to how likely they are to fool an algorithm. Um, also, as I've suggested, these devices are more and more adding in what I call actigraphy plus. So they're building in things like temperature and respiration and so forth into their algorithms. Well, the range of temperature for an, old, an older adult and a young adult is very different. And their um, temperature changes during the night is, are very different than in a young adult. Likewise, skin conductance, um, differs between these groups. But then the other thing to point out is just their baseline for discomfort. So an older adult tends to be more sensitive to wearing something. They're more bothered by a watch. They're more bothered by a device. And so the comfort of a device has to be fit to a particular population. So I want to give a specific example as to why these points are important. So Let's say that I'm doing a physical activity intervention to improve sleep and physical health in older adults. And that my measure is gonna, that I'm gonna measure sleep and physical activity with the Fitbit Sense. And I wanna point out the Fitbit Sense has a lot of different physiological measures and we don't exactly know what they're measuring sleep and activity based on, which of those measures is important. So I could do this intervention, uh, physical activity intervention, and conclude physical activity improved the sleep of the older adults. However, an alternative is that what the physical activity could do is just simply make that person physiologically now better match the assumptions of the algorithms of some of these devices. So for instance, the physical activity made the person's you know, heart rate, uh, cardiovascularly, they're now more fit. And so they're gonna be more fit to the assumptions of the algorithm of the Fitbit Sense, more than likely. But that's important to know because you don't know what's always coming out of these devices or where these, de these numbers are coming from. And it could be that your intervention affected how well suited they were for that um, algorithm. One more quick example. You could say, um, I'm gonna go study people and look at alcohol use and sleep. And I'm gonna measure it again with the Fitbit Sense. Well, I could interpret that. Those who were using alcohol had worse sleep than those who didn't use alcohol. The problem is that alcohol use is also, uh, changes uh, the, the heart rate during the night. And so if I, am an alcohol user, so up here, high alcohol use, blue in the middle is low, lower alcohol use, you're gonna have a different heart rate, you're gonna have a higher heart rate, um, but also a heart rate that's changing throughout the night. 
And this might fool the algorithm, right? And so it could be just that the assumptions of the algorithms um, were not as fitting uh, in an individual that was using alcohol versus a person that doesn't. So this is why it's really important for these devices to be validated in a population and understand what the, your device is kind of doing in order to know whether if you're trying to intervene on something like sleep, whether it's going to be fooled by you know, your intervention actually changing how accurate the device is. Um, and this group has actually since shown that these devices work differently in groups that are and are not alcohol users. So that's a perfect example of, of how that can um, be problematic. Um, so there's also changes I wanted to touch on specifically on Alzheimer's disease for the interest of this audience and think about how if we want to do some sort of sleep device study in this population, what the specific challenges are there. So obviously the, the population is forgetful and there are still devices that require, say, a button press, like press a button when you're um, when you turn off the lights, when your sleep interval starts. So something like that might not be ideal for a population that's forgetful. Uh, they also go through periods of agitation, people that have heard of sundowning, um, in which case they can get particularly uncomfortable or agitated by a device. Um, and then also, again, just that they're physiologically unique. Often when we think of the sleep physiology of an individual with Alzheimer's disease, we take whatever aging does to a person and then amplify that. So if I say that this change, you know, sleep problems change with age, they change very similarly with Alzheimer's disease, but it's just that Alzheimer's is now amplifying a lot of the same things that we see with aging. So in this case, um, it's hard to even measure sleep with e e in individuals with dementia. Sleep is hard to measure even with EEG. Um, but we also have measures, so if we think of the Actigraphy Plus montage, that heart rate variability, which is commonly added to some of these algorithms, blood pressure and so forth, they increase in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And they might also be changing with the progression of the disease so that you'll have a difference in those things with the disease progression. So again, you could have a change in the fit of the underlying assumptions across the course of the disease. So rather than say, you know, sleep getting worse, it could be that you're having changes in the assumptions of an algorithm uh, across the, with the course of the disease. And again, uh, body temperature is another thing that um, is higher and it might not be consistently changing across sleep in individuals with dementia and Alzheimer's as it does even in healthy older adults. And here's a few studies that have used various different measures of sleep and the challenges that you face in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So in doing polysomnography, you have a high exclusion rate. That's part of the um, getting agitated, being uncomfortable with the device. Uh, the, the data can be more challenging and more time consuming to score accurately. Actigraphy had slightly lower, um, although there was a range of uh, validation measures in the individuals with Alzheimer's disease compared to healthy older adults. And then one study used the Garmin VivoSense in particular as one of the commercial devices that have been attempted. And you see that it overestimates sleep time. Um, and in that case, they had tried to do an intervention and polysomnography detected a benefit of the intervention that was not picked up by the commercial device. So that shows you the importance of thinking about whether the device is appropriate. In that, that case, they would have completely missed an effect of a drug um, because of that. And again, you see high data loss, which is really common in, in these populations. So now I just want to turn to opportunities, and the opportunities I think are pretty self-evident from what I've been talking about, but I think, um, you know, rather than focusing on here's the problem, I want to think about, like, here are some ways to work around the problems, but also potential um, for work moving forward. So first of all, I don't think it's necessary to totally rule out using um, devices and measuring sleep in the populations, particularly older adults and um, individuals with neurodegenerative diseases. In fact, it's very important knowing what we know about sleep in those populations. However, when you do it, it's really important to think about um, what device you're choosing and whether there's something that's most appropriate given 
um, the particular group that even within that group, you're going to have a big range. If you have somebody with mild cognitive impairment, they're going to be able to tolerate more and they often have a lot more, um, they're healthier physiologically. And so more of these devices will work on them than somebody that's advanced into AD and, and later stages of AD. You also can think about what is my actual measure of interest. Am I interested in just their sleep duration or am I interested in something that has to do with a particular sleep stage? Um, so in addition to that, it's a matter of choosing your device wisely. And this is going to be an overwhelming chart. But again, I want to emphasize that there are certain aspects of these devices um, that need to be considered. So for instance, battery life is just the most basic thing about a sleep measuring device, um, but that is utmost to choosing a device for a population. So if I don't want to go see the participant every four days to extract data, then an aura ring might not be the, the thing to give them because many of these older adult populations, teaching them to like download, here's how you're gonna download the data from a ring is gonna be overwhelming. Um, and you're gonna have data loss or you're gonna have challenges of, of working with that. Um, but you could say like, oh, maybe is there something in the Garmin Vivo Fit or is there something in this data that I could use instead? Um, so really the, the battery life, the need to charge a device is often a challenge. Even my other example is we worked with the UMass hockey team many years ago, and we had interesting, beautiful data for seven days and then none. And the reason was that's how long at that point in time the device battery lasted. And that was a group that didn't need to they were doing all that they could to be physically healthy and to sleep well. They're, they have a limited schedule. They're doing all they can within that schedule. So they kind of didn't care about the information of the, from the device. So individuals that don't have an innate interest in what the device is telling them, they are unlikely to charge it. They're unlikely to keep it on after they shower. They might take it off for a shower and forget to put it back on or not care about it. So um, it is really important to think about, is it a device that can stay on them? And how long does it have to be recharged? Um, and some of these other factors. Um, so opportunities, obviously, I think that there's a lot of it, opportunities to improve this device space in ways that I've already hinted at um, that really focuses on the abilities and physiolog physiology of older populations. Um, even the screen size and types are a challenge to many older adults um, and yet can be a really interesting tool for um, caregivers. So somebody that's maybe not in the home or not there all the time can um, follow how that that person is doing. We also see it as an opportunity for individuals that are in assisted or um, uh, supported living where you might have a, a support staff that comes in every other day. It gives them some information about how that person performs on days that they're visited versus days that they're not. Um, and then again, I emphasize that there's really need to validate devices specific to your study. Um, and this is partly to say this device will work in my population. These are limitations in a specific population and we can't really draw assumptions across those. Um, just for anybody that's interested, I threw this slide in there to show you what our sleep lab space looks like. So we have a three bedroom sleep lab and one of the rooms allows for a caregiver to stay. Most of our studies use high density EEG, although we also use ambulatory EEG in the homes. Um, and we have a control room from, so that's just a little background of, of how we do all of the work that we do that I just told you about. So I'll end there. I'm really excited to hear questions. Awesome. Becky, thank you so much. That was a tour de force, highly approachable, but also highly technical and lots for us to think about. Um, so I'm going to invite people to raise hands or put questions in the chat. And while people think um, about their questions, I'm going to um, take the prerogative and ask uh, the first of mine. And I'm going to take us past measurement into therapeutics. So as a, as a good doctor, I care a lot about doing things to patients. Um, and one of the things I found particularly intriguing about your description of the phases of sleep, so non-REM two, for example, being a motor thing or slow wave sleep being a cognitive
I'm back. I don't know what just happened, but I would love to hear your question again. <laughs> oh, you're How muted. There we go. How much um, of it did you hear? I don't. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, let me say it again. <laughs> yes, I, I, oh, I just got the beginning of why you're interested and applying. Um, so yeah. I had this great question, Becky, and you missed it. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me ask it again. Sorry. I exactly know what happened. Um, and I apologize uh, on behalf of my hospital, who's, who I would blame <laughs> for, for my AV glitch here. Um, so what I was asking about is that we may care specifically about specific phases of sleep in the context of uh, healthy aging and or cognitive impairment. And so, um, so for example, um, somebody who's post-stroke, we may, and has a motor deficit, non-REM non -REM two may be a phase of sleep that we want to specifically target. Or somebody with Alzheimer's disease who has cognitive impairment, we may want to preferentially enhance um, slow wave sleep. Um, where are we in the state of the science in terms of our ability to then intervene specifically uh, on different phases of sleep to enhance just those and not sleep quality, sleep duration um, as, a, as a more general marker? I think that's a great question. I would say that's where we're at. There are studies that are being, do, being done towards that end. Um, uh, also a little bit of background, the older adults, like slow wave sleep just goes, it's obliterated with aging. Um, you can even take now and then we get somebody that seems like a reasonably healthy older adult in the lab. And we're like, Oh, they had like no slow wave sleep. And so a lot of interventions have been focusing on how to improve slow wave sleep, because that's the one that seems to just get trashed with things like aging. Um, stage two sleep is relatively consistent across the lifespan. And one thing that has been looked at there is to, okay, within stage two, can I make more action happen? And so within slow wave sleep and stage two, ways that we've tapped to enhance them have been targeted memory reactivation is a common one right now, where you can use olfactory cues. If I, if I learn that word pair in the context of a smell, and then I play that smell while a person's sleeping, that is shown to enhance the learning. And some data now seems to suggest that it's either enhancing some of those specific events, so those slow waves in slow wave sleep, or the synchrony of those slow waves and spindles. So it does seem like there's some benefit there. Um, and then there's also some sound enhancements that have been used to try to boost slow waves. Again, a lot of it has been focused on improving slow waves, as opposed to your example of the stroke patient, where we want to really focus on motor learning. There is a lot of sleep there. And so part of the focus there is like, okay, they're probably getting stage two, but we need to get them to have more, which means let me just focus on getting them to sleep longer. The longer I sleep, the more stage two I get. Um, but again, even there, there's some interest in enhancing that with these targeted memory reactivation techniques, the sounds, or so some people, when you're like learning some simple movement, if I play a certain sound, uh, they have shown that you can like enhance memory for that sequence of movements by playing that sound back during stage two sleep. So there's definitely some kind of, those are non-pharmacological approaches. Some of course are thinking about pharmacological approaches, um, but that is, I, I would say where we're at, right? Like that there are these certain stages of sleep that are important. How can we, particularly the older adults, like how can we rescue stage two? Because if some talks, even just at the recent sleep meeting, were really focused on like, if older adults are losing slow of sleep and slow of sleep is where all the glymphatic action is happening, all the waste clearing, then fixing slow of sleep might help us, you know, reduce the onset of Alzheimer's because we're helping them keep the brain clean for longer. So that's why that's been where a lot of the true focus has been. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Deepak. Yeah. Thank you, Becky, for a great talk. I learned something new every time you give uh, on the subject. So I just have a follow on question to slow wave uh, sleep. If the goal is to measure slow wave sleep, do you think that's going to be possible with, uh, you know, with the wrist worn and the finger worn devices, uh, you know, without using EEG, can you actually separate the stage two and REM two versus slow wave sleep if you don't have EEG information? See, I think the challenge is, I think it's possible to do it 
in a very like um gold standard individual so if we have like the the perfect individual i think that we could get there i think the hardest part is that we want it to happen in older adults who defy assumptions right and so i think to to get it something like that to work in a very noisy population that defies our assumptions is going to be really tricky and my vision i'm not you know i for the person that has to put no practicalities behind this is instead to say can we make a little button and each single like eeg sensor and how small can we get those things to make it a imagine just putting a sticker on your temple right to be able to, and then have that little sticker on your temple um mapped to something on your watch right so i'm thinking maybe a little more pie in the sky but i i think i I think something like that is probably more reasonable than trying to ever get sleep stages from a wrist. Great. So we have about two minutes left. So let's take these questions. Um, maybe I'm going to ask Margie, um, could you just take your question really quickly? And then uh, Becky, we'll collect all the questions for Margie, Jen, and Ipsit. And maybe you, uh, you can answer them collectively. I'll make so them quick. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. So um, I wanted to thank you so much. That was a great talk. I learned a lot. Um, I wanted to focus on variability. I'm sure there are some nights people sleep better than others. Uh, and I know that in other aspects of aging, um, that variability is bad. So if you have a lot of variability in blood pressure or a lot of variability in cognitive performance, that has that's bad for you in terms of health and other forms of uh, cognitive aspects and so on. So I wonder, number one, can these devices are they sensitive enough to really differentiate on days in which people have better sleep versus you know, worse sleep? Um, and how can that be useful in terms of trying to understand things that help people sleep better versus worse? Um, so uh, that's my question. <laughs> so Becky, I'm just gonna invite uh, Jen. Did you still have a question? We can just, I just wanna state the questions out and then Becky can answer them in fast. And hopefully your memory is good enough to remember them all. <laughs> Sure. Um, my, my questions focused on the measurement aspects, and you have the importance of validating these measurement tools in patient populations. So I'm wondering if you have any um, recommendations for real world uh, reference, you know, gold standard equivalents to PSG that you can validate these tools, not only in the intended population of use, but also um, their real world environments, which poses uh, unique challenges. Great, excellent. So a related question. And then Ipsit, you get to add the third and then and Becky, back to you. So Ipsit, please. Sure. Mine's a variation on Margie's question. I was wondering about uh, how well these can detect um, intra-individual variances. So I understand they might not be good for uh, comparing two different individuals necessarily, but if there were an intervention like a medication change or whatever, um, uh, what's the sensitivity in detecting changes within the individual um, using these approaches? That's great. The first and last one go together. So I'm going to start with that. And um, I mean, I think that the part of the problem with aging is you do have a lot of variability. And um, you, the again, the variability in sleep itself is um is huge night to night because we all have recovery sleep every time you have an adult that has a three hour night of sleep you're going to have more sleep pressure and sleep more the next night so variability just like every other measure in older adults is high but also things that affect their blood pressure are going to change so frequently and so if you think about using these devices all everything you do that changes your blood pressure everything that changes your your body temperature is going to change um, in an older adult. So um, that's partly answering Marjorie's. And it, it is bad for your health to be highly variable. That was the other question. It's also, there was a study that showed that the biggest predictor of cognitive function was not total sleep time, but variability in total sleep time. And also the all of the data right now, even from my colleagues here, show how important circadian function and living within your circadian clock is to your overall health and how bad for you it is to be sleeping outside of your circadian assigned sleep time. And that's a, a function that we can capture with actigraphy that I didn't really touch on is when is sleep occurring relative to a person's ideal. Um, and can these devices capture intra-individual? Yes, pretty well in an 
a young adult, but there too in the older adult, because there's so many sources of change, sources of variability, that it doesn't seem to do very well within a subject. So we've we've even had some devices that we did this with, where if you measured one night, it can do pre pretty well. And then you're like, but this person was an extreme outlier the next night. So that's why we promote when you do these studies to do more than one night, um, to just see even the stability of that, that validity. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, I also really want to get to why does it change? And those are the things that when you ask the, at a, a, the people doing this work at talks, like, so why, why were, did it work that night and not the next night? We nobody really can get to the heart of that. But yet I think if we can answer that, that's so critical to getting these devices to work better. Um, the gold standard environment, unfortunately, has been the sleep lab. Um, and yet, as you, I think, said, that's not normal. The problem is, is that so many of these other factors um, can change their sleep. And so if your goal is just to say, I want to measure sleep and make sure sleep happens, then it's the sleep lab because I just need to make sure sleep happens. If I want to measure something like circadian rhythms and know a person's more natural behaviors, then the answer would be free living, have them in their home. Um, but even that is something that's been changing a lot um, and, and how to, there's just so many controls you have to have in place in a free living person in order to control for like things that like light, bed partners and all of those things that really, and bed partners is the most common problem you have when measuring in the home, um, bed partners, including pets. <laughs> um, something like 60% of individuals have pets and that's gonna interrupt the, the actigraphy, show up on the actigraphy um, if you're not careful. So those are my quick answers. Great, fascinating. Well, thank you, Becky, for a, a stimulating talk. I think obviously by the nature of the questions uh, and the breadth of the, the conversation, uh, this was a perfect way for us to start off. Um, so uh, we thank you everyone for attending and for those of you that stuck on for a few extra minutes. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time uh, and I hope everyone has a great July 4th.